Uh, the next thing we want to do is take a look at the or different sequence of operations for different parts. Just run through them quickly so that we can see a little better the relationship between the operations and why I chose to do them that way. And let's start with the hammer head. With our part held deeply into the four jaw chuck, we're going to surface the end. Now it's held deeply in the chuck to maintain maximum rigidity. And remember, since this is a two dimensional surfacing operation, the part doesn't have to be well centered. This flat surface is going to become our reference for the actual dimensions. Now that we have our reference surface, we can head over to the surface plate and lay out our actual or length lines. We have a line at 13, 36, 59, and 72 millimeters. Those lines should appear in your sequence of operations along with a sketch that would look something like this. And now we can head back to the four jaw chuck and center our part in that chuck as well as possible because this time we need accuracy. We want the unsurfaced end protruding from the chuck by at least half the length of the part and that's why we scribe that 36 millimeter line. We want the part to protrude halfway out of the chuck so that we can perform all the operations on this end of the part without uh, moving the part and that'll save us a lot of setup and centering time. Now that everything's set up we can surface our part to its final dimension of 72 millimeters. And since the length of this part isn't very accurate, cutting to the scribed line will be more than good enough. Since I've chosen to use a general purpose turning and surfacing tool, uh, I can move on directly to the next operation, which is to turn the 9.8 millimeter diameter, producing at the same time a shoulder at 13 millimeters from the surfaced end of the part. And that is why I uh, laid out that 59 millimeter line in the layout operation. I want to produce a nice clean shoulder here because the next operation is the grooving operation and I don't want the grooving tool to cut that shoulder. It's going to come very close to it but it won't touch it. We can now change our general purpose turning and surfacing tool for a grooving tool and cut our thread clearance groove. And now with the file and the grooving tool removed for safety I can produce my thread lead-in chamfer. We're ready now for cutting the thread and we're going to be using uh, thread cutting oil, uh, M10 by 1.5 die and a die stock. Now note that I'm going to rest the die stock on the tool post uh, to help me with starting the thread, but uh, I also have already removed the tool in the previous operation and that just makes things roll along a little quicker. Now I can finish the thread by hand since it started off straight using the tailstock spindle to line the die and there you go the thread is cut. Now since cutting that thread it probably is going to kick up a small burr at the very start of the thread I can come back with a very fine file and just give it a little lick to deburr that first thread. And here's what the part should look like at this point. Now there's only one operation left to perform on this end and that's the taper turning. And that's going to be simplified because I've already figured out my angles. I've calculated all of that in advance and I don't have to change the part setup because I've planned in advance that I had to leave the part uh, protruding by at least half its length. And that saves time. Actually a little bit of planning saves a lot of time. And that's why a sequence of operation sheet is so important. Now if you've planned out your operations, if you've calculated your speeds, your feeds, your angles in advance, and if you've prepared and lined up all the tools you need, well you can produce this end of the hammerhead in under 15 minutes. On top of that, a well planned out project, well, has a much greater chance for success. And that means less scrap and less money spent to produce a part. So it can really save you a lot of time. And if you look at the example we just did, well, we concentrated all our layout work in one operation. We didn't waste time centering the part for the first surfacing operation. We just rough centered it. 
But then by planning and laying out that central line, by planning on holding the part out of the chuck by half its length, well, we managed to finish uh, both ends with only one setup, one centering in the chuck, because leaving it half out permitted us to uh, do all the operations on each end without moving the part. So now let's take a look at our one to three block project. This project starts, as many projects do, with a good deburring and cleaning of the part. Now, a well deburred and clean part is a safer part to work with. And it's at this point that you want to also verify that your blank part is at least large enough to produce the part that you want to make. Then we can move on to squaring up the block. Now, this block requires machining only on one end to produce a reference surface in the tertiary plane because our secondary and primary surfaces are quite good. This is a cold rolled steel bar and that means that they're square and flat to within about a thousandth of an inch. And that's more than accurate enough for the pre-heat treatment machining operations. And remember, to maintain accuracy sequence after sequence, deburr the part every time you pull it from the vise. And now we can lay out a line from our tertiary reference surface to indicate the pre-heat treatment oversized dimension of the part. We can then mill the part to that uh, scribed line. Now precision here isn't very high. This is still an oversized part for heat treatment. So anywhere around 30 thousandths of an inch over the final dimension will do just fine here. And these oversized dimensions should appear in your sequence of operations because they don't appear on the drawings. The part is now roughed out and squared up, so we can move on to our safety layout. It's a safety layout of the position of the eight holes on the primary surface. If you've watched the full video of this project, well, you'll know that a safety layout is performed when the holes are going to be positioned by coordinates on the milling machine. Remember that when you perform this type of operation, center punches and prick punch marks are not required since a center punching before jig pointing only reduces the accuracy of the operation. Now that the holes have been center drilled, we can move over to the drill press in order to liberate the milling machine for other students and we can perform our drilling operations proper. Remember, six of the holes need to be tapped Two of them are clearance M10 by 1.5 holes. So uh, make sure that the drill dimensions appear in your sequence of operations. Once that the holes are drilled, well, we can move on to our chamfering operation. Now would be a good time to perform our counter bores. Now note that the machine is running quite slow here. Remember, speeds and feeds must be indicated in your sequence of operations. And as always, deburr for safety and precision. The next operation is the tapping of the six M10 by 1.5 millimeter holes. Now, remember, if you're going to be using a series of taps, and in this case we are, since I don't have reduced shank taps, I'm going to have to use a taper to start and a bottoming to finish the uh, entirety of the one inch depth here. So make sure to add to your series of operations all the taps that you're going to use. The last of our preheat treatment operations is, well, the punching of the identification. And you wouldn't believe how many people forget to do this. Now, it's crucial that it be done at this point because obviously once the part has been hardened, this operation and many of the previous ones become impossible to perform. So write into your sequence of operations a note stipulating that this is a good moment to verify that all the operations have been performed before the part is hardened. Since I just mentioned that the identification punching was the last a pre-heat treatment operation. Well, obviously the next operation is heat treatment. And this will appear in your sequence of operation as a note 
that's going to say something like harden and temper to example 45 Rockwell and you're going to get uh, your numbers here so you're going to want to know what the temperature for hardening is what the temperature for tempering is what the uh, soak time is for the hardening in the oven and what the soak time is for the tempering in the oven in this case we're looking at 1550 degrees Fahrenheit for about 20 minutes and for the tempering we're looking at around 530 degrees Fahrenheit for about 45 minutes. But that's not important here because this video isn't about making this part. It's about the sequence of operations. We can now look at preparing the part for grinding. And in this case, we're going to descale the part using an old broken grinding wheel. Then we're going to lap only one of the two primary surfaces on the part. It's not necessarily to lap the whole thing, only the first surface that's going to be going onto the magnetic chuck. And in this case, I suggest that you start with the surface that has the counterboard holes in it. Why? Well, because it presents a smaller surface to the lapping plate. Really, those counterboards are quite huge. And secondly, because our identification numbers are on the other primary surface. And that means that it will be the first surface that I'm going to grind, the one opposite to the one that I'm dressing up here. And that means that I can arrange to take as least amount possible off of that first surface in order to avoid erasing my identification numbers. So we can start the surface grinding operation by grinding the first primary surface, the one that's opposite to the surface that we lapped earlier. Now once this surface is ground and we've taken about half off of what I need to take off, well then we'll flip the block over and grind the second primary, the one that we lapped earlier. And then, using an appropriate setup, in this case a very accurate angle plate, I can grind my reference surfaces on the secondary and tertiary sides of this block. Once that's complete, well, I grind the opposing sides to those reference surfaces. And at the end of all this, well, obviously, my part is done. And all that I need to add to my sequence of operations is a note stating that all sharp edges are to be removed. Now, every part of that sequence was important. It always is to not forget an operation because you waste an awful lot of time backtracking and trying to figure out how you're going to fix the problem that you've just created by skipping an important operation. But if there's one thing in that one, two, three block problem that has caused many, many heartaches and much anguish over the years with students that I've had, it is to forget to verify that all operations have been completed before you move on to the heat treating. Now I am emphasize that in the video, but I'm going to repeat it now. I've seen year after year, time after time, not all, but many students forget to tap all their holes, uh, forget to do the identification punching on the part before hardening it. Obviously, we can unharden the part, uh, we can anneal a part, but that's never a good situation. So, that is an important lesson. Now, let's move on to the drill point gauge. And as is the case with most projects, the first operations on the sequence of this part is going to be a good deburring for precision and safety, followed by a rough measuring to ensure that the part is big enough to produce the part that you want to make. And again, as was the case with the two last examples, uh, the next operation on your sequence is going to be to prepare your reference surfaces. Now, again, in this case, we're working with cold rolled steel. So my primary and secondary surfaces are more than accurate enough as is. Only the tertiary surface needs to be prepared. We can now apply a thin coat of layout blue. Now this is a dye, it's not a paint. So remember, a thin translucent coat is all that's required and it should be applied on a clean and degreased surface. 
The next operation is the laying out of the hole locations and the radii centers. Now just those operations at this point. The laying out of the contour will be done at a later time because if I do it now it will probably be erased by all the drilling and tapping that's coming up. Our next operation is the prick punching of the hole positions and the radii center. Now this first punching applies to all the positions that we've laid out previously. The center punching however uses a larger ball peen hammer and applies only to hole locations not the radii center so it should appear as a separate operation in your sequence. As you can see here, I've identified each hole in the part with its appropriate letter. Now, this is something that is important and should appear on your a sketch, the sketch that's in your sequence of operation, since the next operations to perform will are the drilling of the holes. Now remember, your sequence should include the diameters of the holes because on the plan, they appear as tapped holes and no diameter is given for the drills. Remember, we want to save time by figuring out everything that we can before we get to the machine. The next operation is the tapping of those holes. Now, there are several holes to tap and each one is of a different dimension or a different thread. So, since we produce many of these uh, drill point gauges each year at school, we took the time to organize the tools in a block and that really reduces the chance of error. Now, this wouldn't be something you would do if you're producing just one part, but you could still lay them out in an orderly fashion on a sheet of paper and identify them by their letters A, B, C, D and so on. We can now lay out the outside contour of the part. We hadn't done it earlier with the other layout operation since we were afraid that it would be erased by all the drilling and tapping since some cutting oils remove layout blue. Our next operation is to perform a permanent layout. Now this is important because it's going to ensure that should we erase our layout lines we'll still be able to find those uh, surfaces with the punch marks because once we start cutting we're going to lose our reference surfaces and after that we will not be able to re-lay out those lines. So three light prick punch marks on the straight layout lines and several light prick punch marks on the curves. That is followed by the sawing of the outside contour of the part which is followed by a rough filing of the outside contour. Note that rough filing doesn't mean poorly performed and ugly. We can then move on to the finish filing. Now these two filing operations use different files and different techniques so they should appear as separate operations in your sequence. We can then move on to a first finishing of our primary surfaces. Now why a first finishing? Well because we're going to have to punch these surfaces with letters, numbers and a scale and this will reduce the amount of finishing required after we punch those letters, numbers and scales and thusly reduce the risk of partially erasing those punch marks. The number punching and the scale punching should appear as separate operations since they use different tools and setups. And as already mentioned, those punching operations are followed by a final finishing of the external surfaces. Now, wasn't that a barn burner? I'm the first to admit that a planning sequence of operations isn't the most exciting thing, but it is very important. You know what the old saying says, well, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And this is what you're doing here. By planning your operations correctly, by thinking it through in advance, well, you're buying yourself some prevention and protection against scrap. So, it's important to do this. Now, what we've just seen, again, with the drill point gauge, all the operations, even the little the burring operations, they're important and they must appear in your uh, sequence. But if there's one thing in that that we learn by looking at that project, it's to protect your reference surfaces for as long as you can. Now, most people would attack naturally, without experience, would attack that project 
by cutting the outside shape of the part. It would seem to be the most logical way to go about it. But as you saw in the sequence, we've put that off to the bitter end. Why? Well, because once we've cut it out, we've, lo we've lost our reference surfaces. And that can create a lot of problems when, when comes the time to lay out and drill those holes. Really, we started backwards, but a good planning makes you see those problems ahead of time and gives you a good place to start. So, planning is quite important. Now, we've seen several parts here, and remember that the drawings for the basic projects that I look at in my videos, well, you can get them or download them from my website, that lazymachinist.com, right on the front page, there's a place where you can download the plans. So, I hope that this Lesson 7 will help you and encourage you to plan things out. It's a crucial part of machining and can really save your bacon when push comes to shove. So, until we meet again, have fun. Be safe. That is so important. And happy planning.